And we're going to try, I've got a brand new microphone. All right, that should be looking good. Let me lower this. All right, I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. It is a pleasure to welcome people to another live video here on YouTube. We're going to be talking about learning vocabulary like a native, as I regularly do, but I wanted to do uh, kind of take you through the steps of this, show you with some very simple examples, and also help you understand uh, just through some stories of me teaching my own kids. Uh, all right, Omar with the first comment there. So I'm trying a new microphone in this video. Let me know if that's helpful for you. Uh, if you need me to turn the volume up or down, I can actually control that now, yay. Um, but let me know, uh, hello, let me know in the comments right now. Can you hear me? Everybody coming in okay? Looking good? All right, not yet. <laughs> let me know if you, it's good. Okay, Omar says it's good, all right. I think part of the problem is I'm not using a uh, like a lav mic uh, like the I don't really like those the mics on your on your chest but uh, maybe I'll get one of those in the future uh, anyway this should be pretty good it's loud enough though just want to make sure I uh, need uh, need to make sure everyone can hear me <laughs> all right um, so anyway we're going to talk about vocabulary and I wanted to begin with just a very simple story of uh, teaching my own kids so I have two daughters uh, my oldest, uh, or my, the older daughter is seven and the younger one is three. She will be four years old in about two months, about a month and a half. And uh, I wanted to share just a quick story of how I'm teaching them the language. So one of the first things uh, to understand about language learning is that a word, I'm just going to write, this is not a real word I'm going to put on the screen here. Uh, let's just put some random letters. All right, so this is not an actual word here, <laughs> but it's hopefully helpful uh, for you to understand how a native child or how you as a native uh, of your native language was learning. So you begin with something, when you hear a word, you're trying to connect that with a situation or a thing. If I just hold this up and I say, it's uh, commercurator. I'm probably not even reading that correctly. Eltsmer, Eltsmerkerer. <laughs> So remember, this is not a word. You don't need to remember this. But imagine if this is an, uh, an, like an alien language. And so when you look at a word like this as a young child, or you can't really read as a young child, but you would hear this example. And when you hear something like this, you don't really understand what's, like, what the word means. You're just getting a sound and connecting that with a word. So if this is what the word is for marker or something, uh, you would just remember that and uh, hearing that again and again. So let me put something shorter on here. I'll try it with an actual native example. So if we have a word, let's say one of the first words I'm teaching to my children uh, is triangle. Triangle. So all they're really doing is connecting this shape with this word. And they don't really have a, a strong understanding of what it means. They will probably forget the word if I don't repeat it again and again. Uh, but the first time they're hearing this, they're just looking at this thing. They don't really know what it is. Uh, and then they're hearing this word, triangle. And uh, the next thing, the kind of basic thing they're doing is they're getting repetition of this. So they're hearing me say the word triangle, their mother, maybe some other people might say the word triangle. And so they, they remember this over time, but they're learning it by just kind of repetition of hearing that. Now the interesting that happens, uh, the natural thing that happens is over time, they're not just repeating the word, they're also getting it in different situations. And this is the really important thing about how natives learn. So uh, typically you would take a word like this and just repeat it. So a regular, like an adult English learner, maybe they would have a flashcard. They would have a word like triangle if they don't already know what that is, and then they would repeat that word again and again. But a native speaker, they're actually hearing different words and slowly building a network in their mind. So the kind of non-native way you take uh, like a word in your native language uh, and then a word in 
the English language. So this one maybe like in the Japanese example would be like sankaku for Japanese and then uh, triangle for English. Uh, and then this is really the only connection that you have here. So you have basically one point of connection between these two things. But what a native is doing is they're actually hearing different examples. So let's say uh, a little bit later, usually natives, uh, like native parents, are not teaching their children very systematically. They're teaching their children just whatever happens in the situation. They're not really trying to teach the language. They're just giving examples, and the, and the language uh, naturally comes out. Oh, Fabio, nice to see you there. Well, it's okay. We just got started. Uh, so we have a triangle, and then we hear the word. Uh, let's see, we'll do tricycle. Now, as soon as a native child hears this word, their, their mind, even before the child really realizes it, the mind is going to make a connection between this thing and then this thing over here. So we have a, a tricycle, a tricycle. Now, this, uh, this example is probably a little less obvious for you because you already know the words. But in English, for a native child, they don't know what any of this means. So they just hear the sound triangle. They don't really, they don't really understand what that means. It's not until later that they start really understanding kind of the pieces of the word or what something means. And so the, the network the kind of different points of connection in a child's mind develop as they hear more examples, and that's what really makes the vocabulary easy for them to understand. So as soon as they hear tricycle, they're going to make the connection between this and this, and they, they might not logically think about it that way. Uh, and some natives will actually, so me, when I'm teaching my kids, I'm actively doing this, trying to help them understand the language systematically, uh, and I can teach them much faster this way, but because I'm, instead of trying to wait a few years uh, between these lessons, I'm actually able to teach them much faster. And so this is how I help adult learners as well. So they hear tricycle, and if the parent doesn't say anything about like, oh, look at that, it's, you got try in this word and try in that word. You've got one, two, three things over here, and then you've got one, two, three things over here. Now a child, again, might not be thinking about that so, you know, like they're, again, maybe like a two-year-old or a three-year-old is not really thinking about that much. Maybe a really clever child would make that connection, but the more they hear this, uh, again, if the teacher or the parent is not just explaining how this works, the more they hear this, the more they will start to understand, ah, try means three. And so they're starting to make a connection between what these things actually mean. And so when they hear new things, new words, they hear a word like maybe they're in a, a science class many years later and they hear a word like triglyceride. It's like, okay, that probably means like three of something connected. All right, does this make sense? So the, the point is they're, they're kind of learning two ways. There's the, there's the repetition of something like this, and it's, it's not just hearing the exact same word the same way. This is the naturally varied review of hearing it from different speakers, hearing it at different times, in different contexts, and this is where we're really trying to build not just a translation where we have a single connection between one word and another. We want to build a network in your mind. And it's the network, well, John, see if I can fit a little network over here. We've got all these different pieces that are all connected together. Uh, and that makes it really easy to remember what you learn. So over time, again, you're getting repetition, but you're also getting the varied review and you're hearing things in different ways. So maybe uh, as they get a little bit older, they might hear, Whoops. So here's the word triceratops. Triceratops. Do you guys know what a triceratops is? I can draw one here. You probably know. Uh, this is not going to be a very good picture of a triceratops, but. Do, do, do. Everyone know what that is? <laughs> this is a not very good picture of a triceratops. This is a dinosaur, and you might think, oh, like, look at that. It's got one, two, three horns on there. And so a child would make that connection. A very, again, a smart child would kind of naturally make that connection, but a smart teacher would help the child see those kinds of things and say, look, look, you got try here, you got try here, and you got try here. 
And so you go back and, and again, as the, as the network builds, then you start making more connections between these other things. I think I told a story uh, a while back about, uh, it's kind of like when you, when you watch a movie when you're a young child and you see actors and you don't really know who they are. It's just like, oh, that's an interesting character in a movie. But as you get older, and then you go back and maybe watch, you know, older movies or something, you would see that same actor in different things. And you would think, wow, like that person is like, you know, they, I saw them when they were younger or when they got older, that kind of thing. So they're making the connection, they're building the network in their mind, and it's the network that helps them speak. Now, the reason the network is such an important idea is because when you just translate something, if you forget that, that's it. You've cut the connection and then you're going to forget something in your conversation when you speak. So you're thinking, ah, okay, what's the word for this? And you can't remember, you have to think and translate and organize sentences, and then, oh no, you've lost it, okay? But with the network, you might you know, maybe forget one or two words and it doesn't matter because the network is still here and it will allow you to maybe use something else when you can't think of a specific word that you'd like to learn, okay? Or like to use in a conversation. All right, so hopefully this is making sense uh, as far as trying to learn the vocabulary like this. So you're hearing triangle uh, for the first time and it doesn't really mean anything to you, but as you get more examples, you think, oh, okay, huh, that's interesting. Or maybe I might hear the word angle over here and I think, okay, now I understand like triangle means it's got three angles. But you don't really learn that as a child uh, unless a parent tells you that. So the point of systematically teaching, I talked about systematic language learning uh, or systematic vocabulary learning a few videos ago, but the systematic approach is, is to take this and help you build this network much faster than even a native would do this naturally because you're making these connections and this is just one example of this. All right, does this make sense? Make sure, uh, let, let me know if you have any questions about this. This is very important because again, what most people are doing is they're getting just a single connection between a word in their language and a word in English. So they're not actually becoming fluent in the language. The fluency is built here. It's the more examples you get of something, the more you really understand something like a native, the faster you become a fluent speaker. All right. Remember, your goal is not really to learn as much vocabulary as possible. Uh, it's actually to understand like a native because it's much better if you look at children, they might know fewer words than many adult learners, but they actually can speak much better. All right. So remember that. I know the, the, the typical student, and it's really it's not your fault if you've been learning this way, uh, but the typical student is going to be just trying to learn one thing and I'm going to have a flashcard and go again and again and again, uh, trying to get all these different vocabulary, you know, words or phrases or whatever, trying to learn all those things and then uh, I, I don't actually remember what I want to say in conversations. So it's better to have a smaller vocabulary that you can actually use rather than trying to know a lot of words and you can't actually use them. All right, let me go back and take a look at this, uh, but hopefully this makes sense. Uh, so very quickly, again, we're understanding something. When you just hear a word for the first time, it doesn't really make sense as a word uh, because vocabulary by itself is basically meaningless. I know this is, it sounds like a weird idea, but it's the network uh, that gets you fluent. It's not the vocabulary, okay? It's the network, the connection between these different words that actually helps you speak. So when you learn something over time, uh, you notice I'm repeating myself in videos because I really want to help people understand, but I'd always try to ex uh, explain things in different ways, okay? So it's not just repetition. Repetition is not going to help you learn. It's the naturally varied review. We're going to give you different examples of things, uh, and that's why we can actually help you speak. So we've got triangle, tricycle, and you look at that, you go back like, look at that, oh, angle. And then we've got the word cycle in there, or the piece of the word. And so look at that, we've got three circles over there, three cycles, and that's how you again grow the vocabulary uh, and become a much more confident speaker much faster. All right, so let me take a look and see if, all right, people are getting this. All right, well, it looks like a lot of people saying hello, hello from, from wherever people happen to be. <laughs> nice to see you there. I got uh, Brazil, Ukraine, Bangladesh representing over here. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, 
making sure we got that. All right, so Mandeep says, apart from vocabulary, how to understand sentence structure? How to understand sentence structure? All right, uh, great question. So it, make sure everybody understands this, and I can explain a little bit more about working these into sentences. Uh, but the basic idea, just like learning like this, is that you understand the pieces of things rather than uh, trying to build longer sentences. So if you can't make shorter sentences fluently, then don't try to make longer sentences fluently. All right? So give me, if you want to, uh, let's see, what was that? Was that Mandy? Uh, yes, Mandy, or, or anybody else, give me an example of a particular sentence that you would like to practice, and I'll show you how to do that. So maybe that'll be a little bit easier. Or if anybody else has uh, specific vocabulary that maybe they have trouble remembering, uh, or other phrases, anything like that, let me know. Because I, I gave you a particular example just from my own life, teaching my own children. But if there are specific things you'd like to know, let me know. All right, let's see. Let's see. Oh, Abdu says 78 viewers, but just one thumbs up. Actually, it's like more than that. But yeah, if you enjoy the video, let me know and share it with other people. All right. Uh... So start lesson on advanced uh, grammar in natural way. Greetings from Venezuela. Usage of off words or meaning like off to a place. Ineptitude. <laughs> Ineptitude. Okay, you guys always want to jump right into something advanced. The survey proved very informative. Oh, okay. All right, so we got a couple of different things people are asking about all at one time. All right, let me see if I can organize this a little bit. Uh, let me know what your, I can't read uh, like Cyrillic, <laughs> the Russian, let me know what your name is, but thank you for joining me. Uh, how do you say that I'm sick like the cold flu? Let's give them a positive light, folks. Yes. <laughs> thank you all. Yes, I'm, I'm here to help you learn. My English is just fine, so I'm not here for myself, but I love being able to help other people understand, and when you understand like a native, you speak like one. All right, so let's go back through some of these examples here. Uh, so again, the, the idea of, like, of learning a whole sentence, the, the language is not about learning sentences and trying to remember those. It's about making connections, just like I'm speaking right now. So I'm, I'll use a word or a phrase, and because I know each of these pieces very well, I can connect them in different ways. So maybe I can change one thing, I can not use this, I can put a different word in there instead, and that's how I'm able to speak fluently. So I'm not, I'm not trying to memorize sentences, I'm just trying to understand particular pieces of the language. All right. Oh, Stanislav, okay, all right, thank you. Uh, let's see. So if I can get, let me see, a different, I think I got the, so the survey proved very informative. Let's go with that one, and we'll, we'll cover ineptitude also. <laughs> ineptitude. So you can also begin, or we'll, we'll do inept first. Maybe we can weave both of these into the uh, into a sentence here, because I know people want to do something uh, more difficult. Everyone's always trying to do the more difficult thing, you guys and your difficult stuff. All right, the survey, the survey proved very difficult. The survey proved very difficult. All right. Now, we want to begin, again, with just looking at the pieces of this and make sure you can understand uh, all of the pieces of it. So the first one, we can just look at it as just difficult. If you understand that, I, I know this is a basic, a very basic lesson about this, but a lot of people think they know something and then they can't use it fluently, all right? So we begin with something, just looking at something is difficult, like X is difficult. F X is difficult. So something is difficult, and we can just practice with this. When you're getting lots of examples of this, you will hear this, uh, like, I don't know, learning a particular language is difficult, or uh, trying to stand on your head without using your hands is difficult. So you can make longer sentences or shorter sentences, or uh, like this, uh, this school is difficult, or this exam is difficult. So you can begin with something very similar 
uh, or again, very, very simple without trying to add a lot of uh, sentence structure, a lot of difficult things into the sentence because you want to understand the pieces of something. All right, now once we get something is difficult, we can have x is very difficult. And you probably know very, again, this is a, a very easy thing, very, it's just we're going to make something a little bit more, all right? So it's, we have a difficult thing, and wow, woo, this is very difficult. So I'm going to give you a, a, a simple explanation and a very simple explanation. It's just like maybe one word to explain something, all right? So you know very, we're just going to extend something or, or change it in some way to make it more extreme. So we already have a difficult problem. Uh, and then, again, you're understanding these things uh, like a native. So you might look at, if I'm going to compare two things, uh, like if I'm going to climb something here. So this mountain, this mountain is difficult. This mountain is difficult. Uh, but I might have, like, this one here. This mountain is very difficult. This mountain is very difficult. Now, everyone watching this video probably knows what difficult and very mean, but again, the point is you're trying to learn something and understand like, it, uh, like a native. That way we can get to more things that it shows this is not really a difficult sentence. It's just understanding the pieces of it, all right? So X is difficult, like climbing this mountain is difficult, or climbing this mountain, this mountain is very difficult. So you can see the, the angle is more severe, more severe. So we have a, a much... Wow, like the angle of that, it's, it's like almost 90 degrees for that. So the angle is more severe. This mountain is much more difficult, all right? Now, when we talk about something being like proved to be, so something proves to be, it means you usually like tried that thing and then you found out afterwards that yes, it actually is difficult. So maybe uh, I was talking with a friend of mine. My friend said, oh, this mountain is difficult. Okay, this mountain is difficult. This mountain is very difficult. All right, so at first I'm just listening to what people are saying. They're telling me information about something. This mountain is difficult. This mountain is very difficult. All right, everybody follow me so far. Pretty easy. So this mountain is difficult. This mountain is very difficult. But then when I actually climb the mountain by myself, so I personally climb the mountain. Woo, I climbed to the top. Yeah, I put my flag up there. Wow, that mountain proved very difficult. So I, I actually like show I was like I got proof that the mountain was difficult. So you can say the the survey proved, and you can also put in here to make it a little bit easier to understand to be. So the survey proved to be very difficult if we're talking about a survey, but just for the the it doesn't matter what the specific words are, understanding the structure of this. The mountain, so we'll put mountain up there, M-O-U-N-T-A-I-N. Yes, I apologize for my handwriting. I know my handwriting is not the best. I'm trying to write very quickly. Uh, I'd love to find some kind of digital way to do this in the future. That would be cool. But uh, The mountain proved to be very difficult. The mountain proved to be very difficult. Again, it means that I did something and that I found out actually that that's true. So someone might tell me, again, we're... we're, we're trying to get different examples of this and then use the naturally varied review to hear this in different ways. All right, does everyone, everyone get this? Everyone makes sense? All right, so maybe it proved not to be, or you can say it didn't prove to be very difficult. All right, so a friend of mine said, my friend said, oh, the mountain is very difficult, so it's hard to climb the mountain. But when I did it, oh, it, it, it was not difficult. So it proved to be not difficult for me. Or it didn't prove to be difficult. Okay, you can say either one of those. But this is how we're, we're making sense of this one piece at a time. So you don't want to try to think like, the survey proved to be very difficult. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to understand that way. So look at the pieces of things and then get lots of examples with each one of these. And that's how you understand the grammar. So when I'm teaching in something like Fluent for Life, we're, we're going to be looking at lots of different things and it's, it's the naturally varied review. It's all of the different examples that you get that really help you understand something like a native. And that's the whole point of this video. All right, does that make sense? So I try something and then I actually, I have proof, okay? 
So the mountain proved to be difficult or the survey proved to be difficult means that like we found out by doing it, we have proof now. So we thought it would be easy, but it proved to be difficult. All right, so we got proof. So before we did the survey, we thought, oh, maybe the survey is easy. I can give the survey to someone or take a survey, whatever. But wow, that proved to be difficult. All right. So if you can't remember this, you can say, well, it actually was difficult. So we thought it would be easy, but actually it was difficult. All right. All right. Let me see if I can go back and answer some more questions up here. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't even, let's see. New mode, like, yeah, it's like some kind of disease name, I'm guessing, if that's a real word. <laughs> From Stanislav over there. All right, let's see if I have, all right, so how do we say that I'm sick, like, like a cold or flu or something like that? All right, so this is another good example of how natives are learning vocabulary. And you will hear many different uses of something. All right. A non-native speaker is typically using something uh, in their native language. They have a word or an expression, and then they connect that with English, and they've got this one con connection between these two things, usually a translation, and they're just trying to memorize that English word. Uh, but if you don't hear that from an, a native speaker or you don't get the specific word uh, like the way you want to hear it, you can't hear it clearly from a native speaker, then you, you panic in the conversation because you don't know what people are talking about. You're not prepared for the many different ways that people can say something. All right. So if we're talking about I'm now this is getting losing juice on these markers. See, all right. Now, that was a perfect example. Here, I'll give you. <laughs> So the, uh, let's see, my marker, my marker is running out. My marker is running out of ink, all right? Now what did I just say though? I didn't say my marker is running out of ink or my, my marker is low on ink. Did anyone remember what I said? Did anyone hear what I said? So it's the same idea, but I used different vocabulary. Does anyone remember what I said? See if you're paying attention out there. And again, this is a really good example for when natives are talking about a particular situation and they're using uh, different vocabulary. All right, so what did I say instead? I said, oh, my juice. So I said, oh, my juice is low. Losing juicy, yeah, very, very close. Very close, Sonia, very close. So losing juice. So juicy is more talking about like the, like the juice of a, uh, like something soft and squishy, like a fruit, something like that, but losing juice. So juice is another word for uh, electricity. I'm going to write that badly as well. So electricity, I've got juice, like, oh no, I'm low on power, I'm low on juice, I'm low on electricity. And even though this is not electrical, this is not an electrical marker, I can talk about just like a battery, it's running low on power, running low on juice, all right? So getting back to the sick example. Now you can probably think, uh, you can let me know in the comments, so type a comment, let me know what you say if you're sick. Just tell me uh, I'm sick or you're not feeling well, whatever that thing is, and this will just give a good example or a set of examples of how we can talk about something in different ways, all right? So I'm sick. All right, let me know in the comments, just type in, I am ill, okay? I am ill, anything else? I am sick, okay, same thing. So you can have I'm or I am, same thing. Not well, okay? Very good. Yeah, so these are all perfectly fine things. I get sick, or you can say it, if you're, it depends on the tense, like I'm getting sick right now. Uh, or I got sick, something like that, under the weather. Yep, another good example, under. Under the weather, not feeling well, catch a cold, yep. Now some of these are a bit more general, feeling lethargic, yeah. <laughs> now lethargic, lethargic, lethargic lethargic just means you're kind of slow like you like you ate a lot of i don't know a big meal for dinner and now you you're feeling fat and you can't move around so much so you can have a general 
kind of feeling of uh, feeling lethargic, uh, but that's real. It's, it's not quite the same thing as feeling sick. That might be a symptom of that, or feeling dizzy. That's another thing that's a bit more specific. So in general, we can talk about uh, being ill or just you know, like I'm. I'm not well or I'm not feeling well. Very good. Another one, uh, Amir, from coming down with something. And this is where we, we, we usually begin a conversation if we don't know exactly what the problem is. A friend of ours says, oh, how are you? And I say, well, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm actually not feeling, I'm not actually not feeling very well right now. And then usually the conversation is trying to figure out what happened. So what are the symptoms? What are the problems that you have? So I, I have a cough or I have a fever or a stomach ache or a headache or something like that. And you're talking generally about these different things. And the point is that you can, you can move from more general to more specific. Or if a friend just asks you a question, then you can do the same thing where you're just giving them uh, a specific answer if you know. So, oh, I've got cancer, or oh, I've, I had a heart attack, or oh, I, you know, you know exactly what the problem is. But in general, if you don't know, these are the kinds of things you would use. So, I'm feeling sick, or I'm not well. Typically, not well, and, and you can you can use your intonation, like hey, I'm not, I'm not well. I'm using my body language and my facial expressions to make this a little bit easier, make it clearer. So I can say, yeah, I'm okay. Not, not feeling well, so I, it's not so serious, but well, I'm oh, really, really not feeling well. So that means maybe there's a more serious problem, but you don't know exactly how it is. You can talk about being under the weather. So to catch a cold means you, you know, yeah, I, I caught something. I caught a bug. There's a flu bug going around. So right now, like the coronavirus or whatever, it's going around uh, to go to go around. And this is for understanding things like a virus or whatever. So I could be better. Uh, you would say I could be better. Fabricio, very good though. I could be better. Yeah, I could be better. Or you can say I've, I've been better. I've been better. I've been better. And you can talk about that for uh, for work or for you, like how you're feeling in general. So how are you feeling or how is your company doing? Like, eh, I've been better. It's been better, you know, <laughs> depending on uh, what you're talking about. But these are, again, very good examples of something general that you can use when you're talking about feeling ill. But the point is that there are many different ways of using this. And it's much better to spend your time focusing on learning a bunch of these things and hearing them all used in similar situations rather than trying to learn one phrase for I'm sick and then try to translate that when you need to use that in a conversation. Does that make sense? That's really the most important point about this video. It's the naturally varied review that helps you understand like a native. The whole point of learning vocabulary like a native is so you think like a native when you speak. And natives even like right now, I could be thinking of something I want to say, and then maybe I switch to something else. You don't notice it because I'm doing it so quickly, but you can uh, you know, get the ability to do the same thing if you're learning like this. So remember to learn things systematically. You want to spend time. You want to spend time with the language. I know lots of people, they, they worry about finding a native English speaker uh, to speak with, but really the, the thing that you need from the native English speaker is just the input, okay? So if you can get the input by itself, then you can become a fluent speaker very quickly because you don't need to wait for a native speaker to talk with, all right? Does that make sense? It's not, it's not the native speaker that you're maybe you're talking with that gets you fluent. It's the input. It's the information that you get from that person that builds your network. So if you can get that information uh, without needing a native speaker, then you don't, it doesn't matter where you live or how old you are, that kind of thing. All right. Makes sense? All right. Fantastic. And so there, there are different ways I can ask that. Often I, I will change these up. So if you listen carefully, you can also hear the expressions that I'm using. I, I try to use different ones uh, to mix up, to mix things up for you. Uh, so I, I'll ask people like, 
Like makes sense? There should be a capital, I guess. Makes sense or does that make sense? Does that make sense? I'm pretty good, is it correct? Yep, I'm pretty good. I'm doing just fine, I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm all right. So when people, if you, if you want to begin a conversation and ask someone how they are, just so, how are you or how have you been, if it's, if it's been a while since you've seen that person. All right, let's see, learning phrases of the same topic and applying it. Yes, Christian, uh, you got it. So the, the idea, like the, the application or the practice, the, the practice that people think they have some years is long time no see. Nice to see you there. Uh, the, the practice of it is right here, all right? So you're getting all these different examples of something, and that is the practice that builds your fluency, all right? So you, you don't, what you don't need to do is like go repeat the same phrase again and again in your conversations. What you, need, what you do need to do is build the network of all these different words and phrases so that way in a conversation you can use anything and if you can't remember one thing, you can easily switch to something else. So this is how natives are learning the language, but they're just not doing it as systematically as you could be doing it, all right? So how are you doing? You would say, how are you doing? Or how are you doing, my brother? How are you doing, my brother? How are you doing? All right, Mira asks, could you please tell us how much would prefix and suffix help to reorganize the unknown vocabulary? Yep. So at the beginning of this video, I was giving the prefix try, or just the, the kind of root word or the, or the word piece try. And you will learn a lot of that. Often you will understand prefixes and suffixes later. So just like the native example before, uh, I talked about teaching my daughter triangle. And then I teach her tricycle. And then she learns triceratops. And so as she's hearing these examples, she's kind of learning the prefixes in reverse. So again, a more systematic way is understanding something like try. And as an, as an adult learner, this is an advantage that you have over children who cannot, you know, they're just not as smart as adults. Uh, and they don't have the opportunity to, uh, to ask questions and think like, okay, I wonder if there are other examples of things I can get. So you can direct your learning much more easily that way by, you know, asking questions about the language. And it works the same way. And so you can focus on prefixes, but again, the point is not to to try to learn like one prefix, we're gonna learn the, the prefix try and then get two examples and then learn something else. You really want to get many, many examples of something and not just from one teacher. You want to hear many different people saying things, hear them in different situations. Uh, because often people who may, you might get like an English course or something or have a teacher in a classroom, if you listen to that teacher over and over again, they will be easy to understand after a while, um, especially if they're not already from the very beginning. But most people, if you spend time with that person, uh, you will get used to their accent and their way of speaking. But the problem with that is that if you don't hear lots of different examples, when you get into the real world and have many different speakers, uh, or conversations with many different speakers, there will be many people that you'll have trouble understanding. So this is why it's, again, it's important to hear many different people saying the same kinds of things, all right? So like, uh, like a triathlon, same idea. It's like, oh, a triathlon, what's that? I can imagine a triathlon is probably something with three, three events, maybe, something like that, all right? So I heard from other teachers the repetition is important to develop fluency. Now the, the common here, let me talk about the truth about repetition of vocabulary or whatever. Uh, inside your brain, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this, uh, my, here's my picture of your, your brain. Uh, your brain is, is naturally excited by new information, new, new, new. And the reason your brain is excited by new information is because you're, you're constantly looking around trying to find out if, if something is going to help you or hurt you in a new environment. And so this is from many, many years of, you know, imagine you're living out in a jungle or like the plains and there could be wild animals coming to get you. You're always looking around trying to figure out what's happening or you go to a new place and you meet lots of new people, you want to know who are the nice people, who are the not so nice people, your brain is, is really using a lot of energy to do that. So your brain is always interested in something new, okay? 
Everybody, everybody understands that. We're kind of naturally attracted to things that are new. Uh, and so if your brain already knows something, so if you meet 10 new people and you know, okay, most of these people are good, that guy over there is not so good, maybe I should you know, stay away from that guy. Once you know that information, then okay, your brain is relaxing and you don't need to think about those people anymore. You kind of understand uh, about those people. And it's the same thing with vocabulary. So you'll hear something and you'll, you'll, you'll hear it and you'll know it and you'll learn it just a little bit, but it's still in your passive vocabulary uh, without hearing something again. But again, the, the trouble here is that because your brain is always interested in new information, when you try to repeat things again and again, it's really frustrating for your brain because your brain already heard that word before. Okay, so this is the, the, the nuance about uh, like learning vocabulary and repetition. So the point is not to just repeat vocabulary again and again because this is actually forcing your brain to do something it doesn't want to do. This is why most people just like they can't sit and do like you know one punch or whatever. So Bruce Lee talked about the same thing. I give that example and he says I fear the man who has learned one kick or practiced one kick 10,000 times. So one guy's like just sitting there doing that same punch over and over and over again. Really, it's the boredom of that kind of thing that makes it very difficult for people. And the reason it's boring is because it's not new, okay? So this is the really one of the big problems about language learning, that if information is not new, you won't want to remember it. All right, so Christian right now is, is I am excited about this new information. All right, so if you're talking about what I'm saying right now, like, this is exciting because it's new. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, like this, here's some new information about how my brain works. So it's not your fault. You're not like a lazy student if you don't want to study. It's just your brain doesn't care about old information. So once you hear something, this is why we watch the news on TV, okay? I'll get back to Salman's question in a minute. So we watch the news. People want to know what's new. We're not watching the olds on TV, we're watching the news, <laughs> okay? And so again, the reason we do this is because the brain, it's always looking for new information. This is why it's so difficult for people to develop mastery in something, because mastery requires that repetition. You have to do something again and again. So the problem, again, just want to make this very clear, the problem is your brain does not like repeating things. Your brain does not like repeating things. So you really have to work hard. You have to have discipline to do that. So what I discovered is that, okay, it's much easier just to understand things the way natives do, and that's why we use naturally varied review, all right? So the solution to this problem is naturally varied review. It's not to repeat things again and again. Even if you are, are like a great student and you just repeat something again and again, it's really not building your fluency. It's kind of building your memory a little bit. But again, the network is the thing that helps you speak fluently. It's not trying to learn one word and remember it and watch it again and again or hear it again and again. It's that kind of thing where you're hearing something just like the examples that I gave earlier in this video of making connections between different words. So we've got triangle, triceratops, tricycle, triglyceride, the same kind of thing. All right. So you don't. You, if you take a flashcard and you write a word on it, like we're going to write, uh, I don't know, like try something. It doesn't matter what the word is. So here's my flashcard, and we're going to write a word on there, and I'm going to do what people call spaced repetition. So in five minutes, I will review it again, and then two days, I will review it again. Okay, like whatever the the thing is, it's much faster and easier to actually try to try to learn it uh, systematically. Okay. Let's see, uh, this is called incentation. Actually, I'm not familiar with that. But if, if you're describing what this is, then yes, that's it. Typically, I try to just make it easy for people to understand without using a, like a difficult word to understand this. But the point is, it's learning vocabulary systematically and by uh, keeping things similar but not the same, your brain thinks it's new information. I mean, it is new information, but the point is it's, it's similar. You're getting repetition, so you might hear one word like, you know, tricycle or triglyceride or whatever from different speakers. And that's, again, it's new. So each time you hear it, your brain is like, oh, okay, that's the word sounds like this from that speaker. 
or the word sounds like that from a different speaker, okay? So it's not the same thing. You repeating something is not going to get you fluent faster. Oh, incantation, oh, an incantation. Well, an in, incantation would be like, that's actually repeating something like, or saying uh, like a magic spell, something like that. that that's an incantation, incantation. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm really just talking about uh, the straight repetition of something versus naturally varied review. All right. So the way you learned your native language was by naturally varied review. You would hear a word. You would hear it in many different ways from different speakers. You would hear it in different times. You would hear it in different contexts. You're learning the grammar, pronunciation, the vocabulary building. All of that is happening together. Uh, so when I repeat it, I got bored too. It has happened with me. Yes, it happens with everyone because that's how our brain works. <laughs> and again, the reason our brain works that way is because like, you want to be very quick about finding information in a new environment. All right. All right, let's go back and make sure we got everybody's uh, questions over here. Uh, all right. So Salman says, I'm preparing for competitive exam, and there are about 5,000 fixed words that are asked in the exams. How can I master these particular words? Uh, you would probably benefit from my uh, How to Remember Any English Word program. If you go to EnglishAnyone.com, actually, you probably just Google that. I think maybe we don't even offer that publicly anymore. It's only available in uh, Fluent for Life. Uh, but you can learn about that in, uh, in the Fluent for Life program. Uh, but this is about using this same idea of instead of taking vocabulary and trying to remember it, we want to make the vocabulary new in your mind, all right? So the, we're using that a kind of uh, strategic way of learning a bunch of words very quickly, and that's going to help you do that. So if you'd like to do that, uh, look that up, how to remember any English word, uh, go to our website and you can find that. All right, let's see. So Christian says, it seems to me you should apply the information you're listening. Listening news is good, but try to use what you're listening. Um, I, I, this, is, this is probably the, the biggest thing that people argue with me about for language learning. <laughs> about, well, yes, it's good to listen to stuff, but yes, you have to speak at some point. And I say, if you can't actually use something fluently, why are you talking? The fluency is developed by getting all this different review. You, you know it so well that it just comes out automatically. So you can try to repeat things, you can say things if you like, uh, even if you're not really comfortable with them. Like I could learn a word in Hungarian or Chinese or whatever. Someone could tell me something and I could try to say that word again and again. But I don't really understand that. It's not me saying something that gets me fluent. It's me understanding something that gets me fluent. And then I can speak. All right? And I know this is a, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what everybody tells you to do. So it's unbelievable. <laughs> so everyone says, Drew, you have, to, you have to speak in order to get fluent. But the truth is, it's really the understanding of something. So what most people are doing, and this is why most people don't speak, all right? <laughs> now, if, if like the, the traditional way worked, everybody would be speaking, you know? But the traditional way does not work. And I mean, even for the people who are really good students, they do a lot of practicing, uh, a lot of trying to speak with people. They're still not good speakers. But the people who become good speakers, they're getting naturally varied review. They understand the vocabulary really well. All right. So what I mean by that, just like the example I gave before, we've got triangle, triceratops, triglyceride. As soon as you hear these different examples, you're like, ding. There's a little, you can actually feel yourself getting more fluent because you feel yourself understanding something like a native. All right. How can I remember words with lots of meaning? All right, so that's, a, that's also a different, a different thing. You will have many words like the word bark. So bark, uh, like the bark of a tree and the bark is the same sound that a dog makes, bark. So here we've got a word with two different meanings. And this is why uh, vocabulary by itself is really meaningless. It's all about the context of the word and then you get that in many different contexts, okay? All right, let's see here, we got a couple more. What does it mean lay off and take off? So lay off would mean, there's a couple different meanings of that. You could also have like the job layoff. Like if you lay someone off, it means to, to say, okay, we're, we're making you, you're, you're, you're being fired, but it's uh, maybe you, it's, it's less severe than being fired. So if I get laid off, maybe my company sold something and they don't need my department anymore and they just stopped doing it. So they laid me off. 
all right? But if I did something really bad, I got fired kind of thing. So that's laid off. Uh, but take off, uh, again, there's different meanings of that, but usually it means to remove one thing from another. So these are examples of phrasal verbs. I uh, highly recommend you check out our visual guide to phrasal verbs so you can understand these things like a native, get the natural varied review that actually uh, helps you understand these things like a native rather than trying to learn like a definition very quickly from an example. All right, so remember, I, people always like, like, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? You're only going to forget that if you just get a definition or a translation. So the point is not to get a definition or translation. It's to build a network, take a word, even one word, it doesn't matter, and then you're building a network around that. And then you, you start doing that with other things. And very quickly, because you're learning systematically, so you're actually learning the native way, but it's more efficient. It's faster than the tr traditional way that natives are learning the language because you can, you can be systematic with how you're learning. All right, let's see uh, what else we got here. How to enhance public speaking skills. Yeah, so that's, a, that's another thing. Usually the, the public speaking thing, like for me, uh, number one is making sure, probably the most, the, the fundamental, most important thing about public speaking is to make sure that the, the information you have to share with people is valuable. Uh, so even if you're not a very good speaker, you can still share something valuable and people will appreciate that. So it's, it's not about like holding your hands on the podium or how you stand or whatever, just making sure you provide value. That's the most important thing. Uh, and that will also build your confidence. So if you don't feel very confident about what you're, what you're saying uh, or you don't think the value is very good, then you won't feel very good and you won't deliver a very good presentation. But even a person who is a little bit shy that has good value, like a comedian who's a little bit shy, but he's, he's still speaking anyway and his jokes are funny, he will develop confidence from that. All right, let's see. So I'm enjoying your videos and getting natural air to learn. Yep, glad to hear it. All right, let's see. Uh, is it right The listening is the key to speaking? All right, uh, I want to make this very clear for people. The network. The network you build from naturally varied review is the key. The network. The network. Remember, your brain, your brain actually looks like this. All right, inside your brain, if you look at it, like it's like a bunch of these different connections. And so when you learn words like this, you make that connection very strong, just like having a building. It's a structure that's very strong because it's got all these different connections. So you can't push it down. It's all working together, okay? So part of this is listening, listening. So we'll put an L here for listening. Part of this is writing. We'll put a W here for writing. Part of this is watching some, oh, I guess another W for watching. So it's how you're getting the information. A small child, uh, if their mother tells them, don't touch the stove, it's hot. Don't touch the stove, it's hot. And so they're, they're hearing the word hot. Okay, mom said the word hot. I don't know what hot means. And so they touch the stove and oh, now they understand what that means. So they weren't listening to anything. They actually connected the word hot to the feeling of being hot. All right? So it's, the, the, the point is not to just listen. You're like listening to podcasts or whatever. The point is to develop understanding uh, of, of something really well. Okay? And so you get that from many different things. It could be listening. It could be watching. It could be reading something. But you should be getting lots of these different examples in different ways. And this is why students in Fluent for Life, they are doing reading and writing and watching and listening. And they even do a little bit of speaking, like they try to teach something to other people. But the point is to develop this network, because the network is the thing that gives you confidence. All right? When you, when you don't really know something very well, you feel nervous about your pronunciation or you're nervous about your grammar. Uh, you're like, okay, do I say this or do I say that? I don't really remember. So you get stuck in conversations asking these questions. And that's why people are always trying to speak and the teachers are saying, it's okay if you make mistakes, go ahead and speak. But that's not really very good advice for people. What you really want is to understand something really well and then go out and speak. Because, the, the, again, the network is the thing that gives you the confidence because you know the information so well. All right. Nice to see you there, Ronnie. All right. So let's see. So acting, helping us to understand those things. Uh, very perfect equals flawless. Well, perfect equals flawless. I mean, very perfect is you wouldn't really put like, I mean, you could put very on there, but 
it doesn't doesn't really change anything. Uh, impel, compel, and impose and differences. <laughs> Now, if I, if I explain something like that, you will probably forget it anyway. Again, the point is to take words like that. Let me give you a much better, much better thing to do. If you go to Google and spend some time with those words, so don't just look for a definition, type in like compel and look at what all the examples are. All right, so use Google as a way to answer questions for yourself. Uh, and then you can use that like for a verb, you might do compel. Uh, or impel or whatever these these various words that you can learn it's much better to take some time with it and actually build some again you're building the network you're not trying to get a definition what's the difference between this word and that word the point is to spend time with the language okay so you can build your network I just do this when I'm teaching lessons and helping people get lots of different examples of things in different ways because regular repetition is not going to help you get fluent it's going to be very difficult for you to get fluent you might know one example of something you repeat it again and again and again but you're still not speaking fluently and the reason is because you'll this is just one way of saying something and natives may not use that way of saying something in a conversation. So if you've only got this one way of saying something, you will struggle in conversations, all right? So I use Google to understand the word it shows in various ways. Exactly, exactly. So you want to spend time with the language and, and you will see, like if I, go ahead and put, put bark, put bark in, in a Google search, just, just put that word in there. And you can do an image search for this as well. And it will show you at least two different things. Now, I have not tried this, but I'm sure it will. Doing a Google image search, so not just like a, a word search, actually going to the, the images and typing in a word. This is a great way to learn vocabulary. Uh, this is why in Frederick, we actually have uh, four different icons for every word because we want people to understand them. And it's much easier to do that, again, from the context. It's a naturally varied review that helps you build this network. Each of the examples you get is another way of helping you understand something. So if you go, uh, go to Google, type in the word bark, uh, and you will see things like, you will see pictures of trees, and you will probably see pictures of dogs, like, you know, barking like that, like, rawr, 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 rawr. you will see both of those, all right? Does this make sense? So the, the point is not if you, you go to Google and say, like, what does this mean? And you just look up one meaning of it or you get a translation in a dictionary. It's really going to be more confusing. <laughs> so you have to spend time with the word. And this is why the, the whole point is to, is to make sure you're building a network of something rather than just, uh, again, getting one translation. This, this is the most dangerous thing in language learning right here. All right. Having one connection. Most dangerous thing in conversational English, most dangerous thing in you know, learning any language. Because if you lose that connection somehow, if you forget that word, you can't think of that conversation, then you're in, uh, uh, when it, whatever, you're talking with somebody, and then I, I can't remember what I wanted to say. And so that's when you struggle. That's where the, ah, the nervousness comes from. Or if you only hear it from one person, you, you're not really prepared for uh, other people giving you those, maybe like a different, different way of saying something in a conversation. All right. All right. Let's see. Uh, all right. So let's see. Christian says, or Chris, Christian, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Apologize if I do, uh, or if I'm not. Uh, do you recommend apps for English writing in order to improve that field? Uh, I don't, I, I've never used anything like that to improve my own writing. I just, I look at the kind of writing I'd like to do better and then copy that and then actually with like a, a like a pen or a pencil and paper. Uh, and that's how it's going to improve my, my writing. I spend time with lots of different examples. It's the different examples. It's a naturally varied review in all these different learning situations that really builds your fluency. All right, Claudio says, hi, Drew. Long time no see, uh, and it is great to see you and learn. My question is, uh, when we use the word upon, can you give us example detail, please? And use the word upon. So again, another example of when you would look at something like Google, or you can even do a, a YouTube search for something like upon. I think maybe I did a video about this, but you could say like, you know, the, the duck is sitting upon the water. 
And upon is often uh, used just like on. There's no real difference between those. We could all say once upon a time. You'll hear that a lot in uh, stories for children. So once upon a time, once upon a time. It just means like at this time, once upon a time. And the point is, again, not to get just one example of something. I'm trying to give you some different ones. But as you learn these different examples of words, sometimes you will find that the word just, it's the same word for two completely different things. So there's no connection between uh, the bark of a tree and the bark of a dog. It's, it's just the same word that we use for both of those things. Or you might have a word uh, that sounds the same, but maybe it's spelled differently, like night. So you might have N-I-G-H-T for night, like morning, when, when daytime and nighttime. Or you have night, like K-N-I-G-H-T, where that's like a, a knight, like fighting with a sword, that kind of thing. So there's no connection between any of those logically. Uh, even if there is like a historical connection, it's not important for understanding the words. Sometimes you just have to, you, you break a word into different pieces or different parts, and okay, uh, there's no real connection here. You could make a connection just to help you remember it if you like. Uh, but the point is you will have some things where uh, you're, you're building the network for bark as its own thing and then for uh, like barking a, of a dog as its own thing as well. All right. Uh, the way you talk is so clear and perfect. Thanks a lot. Glad to hear it, Lewis. Yes, I am intentionally speaking clearly so people can understand what I'm saying. So what I do in Fluent for Life is I take you from understanding teachers like myself, so trying to take you from... Uh, understanding something in a very easy, clear way to how can you understand native speakers in a conversation, all right? So we have to do that in simple steps, helping you understand the vocabulary, giving you lots of different, uh, yes, homophone. Again, I'm not, <laughs> the reason I'm not, not using like the technical, technical definition or the technical name for lots of things like grammar points or whatever is number one, natives don't know that information, a lot of them don't, and number two, it's not necessary to know that, that that's the case. But you would learn a word like homophone, and it's like homo, like, mm, that means the same. That's interesting, like a homophone. Same sound, homophone, homophone. All right? But yes, you're correct. Uh, so remember, again, it's the network, the network. All right, so how much, let's say grammar is important, or you would say how important is grammar? Grammar is the most important, more important than anything else. But remember, as you're learning this, you're learning grammar and pronunciation and vocabulary at the same time. There's not really, like a native speaker, when they're learning new words, it's, it's all grammar and pronunciation and listening. So you don't need like a separate, uh, the way I teach is kind of helping people understand these in different pieces. But a native speaker, really, they're just hearing things, even if I say, I am hot, I am tired, I am cold. Okay, those are basic examples of grammar. The grammar is, is like identity, so you're, you're saying this thing is that thing, or there's a connection between these two things, all right? So the grammar and the pronunciation, listening and the vocabulary, confidence, all of these things, when you understand like a native, they all develop naturally. Your pronunciation improves as you get lots of different examples, number one, of the same vocabulary, number two, from different speakers, all right? So any tips to improve grammar? It's this. It's all the, the exact same thing. So when you, when you take something, just like I, I gave an example with some grammar earlier in the video, uh, I was talking about uh, like the, the mountain proved to be difficult. So understanding the pieces of that sentence. So something is difficult, that's pretty easy. Something is very difficult. All right, that's a little, that's pretty easy to understand as well. But then something proves to be very difficult as well. Wow, like proves to be, huh, I wonder what that means. So rather than just telling you what something means, it's much better to understand something like that through a story. And then you're hearing that in many different ways. So the mountain proved to be difficult after I climbed it. All right, so that's the, the whole point of that, that particular structure of something proving to be difficult means you have proof now because you did that thing. So as an example, I might be worried about a test and then I take the test and oh, it, it proved to be pretty easy. Okay, so I was worried about the test before I took the test. I'm, I'm worried, I don't know what's going to happen. Will it be difficult? Will I fail the test? But then I take it and oh, it, it proved to be pretty easy. So it actually was pretty easy. 
And again, the more examples you get and the more different ways you're hearing something and from different speakers, that's how you build your fluency automatically, guaranteed. Okay, so you don't need to have a person there uh, practice your speaking, trying to repeat phrases to yourself or trying to repeat them to other people. You, it's much better, like if you've only got five minutes or 10 minutes a day to practice, don't try to repeat something, try to get more examples. Okay, get more examples of something. It's much better, you will, you will improve your fluency just in an incredible way just by getting more examples of something rather than trying to, trying to hear the same thing again and again. All right, so we already know that your brain does not like repeating things. So you have to force yourself to do it. You get very bored trying to practice things, even people who are good students. All right, uh, let's see if I miss anything else. So can we use extremely instead of using very? Yep. So again, this is another thing where uh, learners are often worried about, like, uh, like, can you say like more frequently or quite frequently or very frequently? Often your intonation is more important there. So if I say like, wow, we did a lot of study, a lot of study. Okay. So it sounds like, wow, that's that's a lot. I said, yeah, yeah, I did a lot of studying. I did a lot of studying. Then maybe it doesn't sound like so much. So it's, it's less important to focus on vocabulary and try to think of like a, like a word order about like this word and that word and this is more extreme than that one. Your intonation is much more important and it's also much easier to remember that and use that in a conversation. So I could remember a few words and just put more stress on those words. So wow, I did, ooh, I did a lot of studying, a lot of studying. Or yeah, I did a lot of studying. Which one is more? It's really how you say it. So the intonation is much more important in your actual conversations. Uh, what about the book Word uh, Power Made Easy for Word Building uh, for Building Vocabulary? Uh, pardon me. Uh, I, actually, I had that book when I was a kid. My dad got me that book, and you know, so I'm looking through the book, and what you find is is that you're okay. You're you're getting lots of examples, and a book like that is designed to try to teach you a whole bunch of information uh, when it's a little bit different for building fluency. So you will probably remember some of that vocabulary. Uh, a lot of it you will not remember, and then you will not be able to use it fluently. So. You can think about it like you have two choices. Very important for language learning, two choices. So choice number one, you can try to learn like uh, 1,000 words. And every day I'm going to try to learn 10 words and it's like, okay, here's, I'm going to take 20 minutes and here's this word. I get a definition, maybe a mnemonic or something, a memory aid I'm using to remember something like that. And then I've got all these different things. So that's choice one. Choice two is to try to learn 100 words, but to know those words extremely well. All right. So I'm going to learn one thing and then I'm not, I'm not just going to jump to the next word. I'm going to spend some time with that word. I'm going to hear this in different ways. I'm going to hear it from different speakers. I'm going to hear it in different contexts, in different, uh, maybe the, the grammar for that purpose. I'm going to hear it in the past, the present, the future, or maybe I, what I would have done, something like that. I'm really going to spend some time with this. And as I do that, this is actually building my vocabulary for like other things. So I'm really building my vocabulary. It's giving me like this same amount of words, but in a, in a roundabout way. So I'm not, the goal is not to learn 10,000 words, but you'd learn 10,000 words naturally and automatically by learning this way. All right. So it's much better to do this a couple of times. Like each day you just spend, spend a little bit of time with a few words and hearing that from lots of different people, and you will build a fluent vocabulary much faster than you will doing like this. I talk about this on the channel a lot, but vocabulary building is like planting seeds. And you can get lots of seeds. You can go get a book like the, the Word Power thing, and okay, I'm gonna try to plant these seeds in my mind like that. So this is your, your head here. And you can try to put all these seeds into your mind like that, and then each day you put more new ones in here. But in this example, I'm actually going to put the seed into my mind, but I'm going to give it water and sunshine, and I'm going to spend time with it so the plant grows up. In this example, all these plants die. 
you might remember a few things, but really you're you're wasting your time because you're you're just you're spending time with one thing and then you kind of forget about it. You move on to the next thing and you forget about it each time you move on. But with these, you're building the network. It's the network that builds your fluency. All right. So it helps you remember the words, helps you use them fluently. All right. Let's see if we have anybody else over here. All right, so how time, you mean what time is it where you are? I'm dying to know, Japan or USA? Uh, wow, it's 3 a.m. where you are. I don't know where that is. Uh, it is, what time is it? It's 11.06 a.m. here in Japan. All right, how can I stop translating in my mind? All right, so this is the, like the fundamental problem of language learning is because people are learning one language through another language. So they're using, like my, when I used to teach in classrooms here in Japan, uh, my Japanese students, they would have a bunch of Japanese textbooks and the teacher would explain things in Japanese and then I would say something very quickly in English and then they would move on to the next lesson. It's like this. Everybody is doing this. And that's why everybody forgets and they can't use things in their conversations. So instead of trying to learn things through your native language, you get naturally varied review. All right. Does that make sense? So you're spending more time with fewer words, but that actually builds your fluent vocabulary much faster. Because this one, you might be getting more words, but you're losing those words at the same time. So you're just, you're moving through, you're like, you're getting this word and you lose it. And then you get a new word and then you lose it. Maybe a few of them you remember, but most of them will not be part of your active vocabulary. And the active vocabulary is what you need to have a conversation with people, all right? So if you're, if you're learning and you're trying to think and translate in your head, this is because this is the way most people teach. And either, like on YouTube, you will find two kinds of video lessons. The first kind is going to give you translations. So in most countries, there is like a popular YouTuber, like we have them in Japan, uh, like popular YouTubers uh, for a particular country. And so they will teach Japanese people English through Japanese. And so the videos are like, it's much more entertaining than what I do. <laughs> so they spend, you know, they can spend much more time doing things because they're using Japanese in order to teach. But the problem is it's not building fluency because those people are, are learning to think through their native language. All right. So in like in Spain or Argentina or China or Russia, it's the same thing everywhere. People are using their native language to help people learn English. So the second way is that you're going to see people learning uh, through uh, examples of native speakers, so native English speakers, this is like what I do where I'm helping people learn English in English, but the problem with most of those lessons are there's no naturally varied review. So it's still like this. Hey guys, today welcome to this video. We're going to teach you uh, 10 amazing new phrases and then you will forget those by the end of the lesson. Okay, so it's much better to actually spend your time, okay guys, we're going to work on one phrase a day. And by the end of it, you're going to know it so well that when it gets into a conversation, you will be able to talk about this and that and use it no matter what you're talking about. All right? So Samir is asking, how do you think in English? It's the exact same thing. All of the problems that people have in language learning is because they do not learn this way. Every problem comes from that. Okay? Every problem comes from that. So I have trouble... Uh, remembering words. I have trouble thinking about grammar. I have trouble with my pronunciation. I can't understand natives. I have trouble. All these things, every one of these problems, every one of these problems is because you are not doing this. All right. And it's not your fault. It's just the way everybody teaches languages. All right. So the, the way YouTube works for language teaching is again, remember, we just talked about this before. New new, new, new. Remember that your brain is excited by new information. And so people are always trying to make new content. Learners are always looking for new content. And that's why they don't remember anything. <laughs> so what you actually need is content that's similar. So you're getting the review you need to build fluency. All right. And that's what naturally varied review is. So do not learn through your native language. It's much better to learn things and get examples all in English. And then you want to get naturally varied review because that's going to teach you the pronunciation, the grammar, the vocabulary, and it will develop your listening, your confidence, and your fluency all by itself without you having to speak. Again, it's getting the input, all right? The naturally varied review is the thing that's going to get you fluent. It's not trying to repeat one phrase again and again. That's not going to build your fluency, 
The fluency is in the network, all right? It's just the way your, it's the way your mind works. But you have to kind of trick your mind into giving it new information, all right? Yes, even uh, Anderson, excellent point. So even native speakers don't remember all the words. Yeah. And again, the, the, the thing about being a native speaker, so that's a really good point, is it's, it's in this network. You will see this all the time. Now, kind of tricky thing that natives do, this is even a joke for many native speakers, is they will be spelling something. So a native speaker might try to spell something. Now it's much easier because you can get the spell check from your computer or whatever, or your phone. Uh, but if people forget how to spell something, they will just use a different word. <laughs> and so they will think like, how do I spell restaurant? Like rest, rest. Orant. I, I can't spell that. Let me just use a uh, uh, pasta place. I went to a pasta place. <laughs> and so if they can't remember how to spell something, they will, just, they will just change the word. And in the same way, if they can't remember a specific phrase, they'll just use a different one. And that's what I'm doing right now. So you're, you're, you don't see it, but my, I'm, I'm fluent because I'm naturally just processing this information without thinking about it. All right. So I'm not I'm not stopping to think, oh, no, I can't I can't remember that one thing I wanted to say, because that, that would be a, a bad presentation <laughs> if I just if I stopped every five minutes and was thinking or that kind of thing. And this is what most learners have to do because they didn't build the network. And again, it's not your fault. This is just the way everybody teaches their they're using this, like all of this, uh, the stuff on YouTube, it's giving you all this like new, new, new information all the time. It's, it's basically kind of tricking, uh, using, using your brain against you. And it's wasting your time, all right? But it's more entertaining. So people are like, yes, it's more entertaining to learn that way because it's new, all right? But the, the trick is to, you gotta trick your mind back and give it new information by giving it naturally varied review. So you change the information, not just give it uh, the same way uh, again and again. Uh, Pawn says how to spell words correctly. If you wanna learn how to spell, go to englishanyone.com and get this. F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-T. This will teach you how to spell like a native. Okay, Frederick. All right, uh, let's go back and see if we missed anything. Well, Zakyama says, uh, could you teach me how to read documents written in English faster? Should I read books as much as possible, or should I combine reading with listening to read? Yeah, I guess it, de it depends on what your, what your reading speed is and what you have to read. If this is uh, like stuff for textbook reading, like your academic life or something like that. Again, get more examples of the kinds of things you like to read. If you read one kind of book, if you like mystery novels, read a lot of those. You will get better uh, at reading that information. But make sure you can understand at least 80 to 90 percent of the things that you're reading because if it's too difficult and you have to go to a dictionary all the time, it will be very frustrating for you. Uh, what if I cover, let's see, I highly recommend learning English grammar naturally without studying it a lot. Yeah, again, the, the, the point is not to, not to try to force yourself to learn rules. The point is really to understand it like a native. And you understand grammar like a native as you get lots of examples. And that's what it means to understand it naturally. All right. All right, Salman asks, what if I cover only one session a day of the book? Uh, I don't know what, what you're asking about specifically. Uh, but again, the, the, the point is to, to focus and then spend time with the language on, about that thing, whatever that is. All right, um, let's see if we have, let's say, good morning from India, how to think in English. So same thing, so this is, this is how you think in English. This is how you think like a learner. This is how you think like a student, all right? Uh, you mean we have to learn those words which are common in speaking? Well, it's, I mean, obviously you would learn words that are common, but it's the, it's the words for your life. If I am a doctor working in a laboratory, then I will, I will use different words than a professional soccer player, all right? So it's not about like getting a word list, it's about thinking about the, the vocabulary that I use in my native, my everyday, you know, regular life, however you, need to, however you need to use the language. Now, some people are learning English and they don't actually need to speak. They don't care about speaking, maybe they just want to watch movies or something like that. If you want to do that, then focus on a particular thing, like watch movies by a particular actor or a particular kind of movie. And you will see it's gonna give you naturally varied review. You're going to get the different examples of something in different ways, all right? So the point is repetition doesn't work, all right? 
And it doesn't work because your brain doesn't like to review because it's boring. Your brain wants new information all the time. So you have to give your brain new information, but it should be related to what you're talking about. So I can learn all about dogs. Like if I just learn the word dog in one language uh, or another, I can learn that word dog. But there are lots of different kinds of dogs, like a Dalmatian or a Rottweiler or a Poodle or whatever, you know, all these different uh, kinds of examples. And so I'm going to spend time with that. So in my case, when I understood, uh, when I came to Japan, this is after I had failed to learn languages for 15 years. And I came to Japan and I thought, wow, the magic is that you're in a native country and so I'm surrounded by Japanese people all the time. I should become fluent and I did not. It was only more frustrating for me. And the reason I became fluent is because I, I just noticed how children were learning the language. And I said, oh, look at that. They're not using flashcards and things. They're getting naturally varied review. They're understanding like a native speaker. It's like you can't use a translation to teach a child because they, what other language would you use? You have to teach everything all in that language. So you can't use anything else. You can't use uh, textbooks or writing or reading, things like that, especially for young children because they don't, they're, they're just learning everything. Uh, like just either they understand it or they do not. So a good parent who's making the language understandable will have kids who are speaking uh, much faster. And so me, I can like really take that to a higher level with my own children. And even though I don't spend a lot of time with them speaking in English, uh, like I don't, you know, I'm away from the house, I'm out working or whatever, they spend most of their day in Japanese. But I can spend an hour with them in English and actually teach them much faster because I understand how to teach. All right? But all I'm really doing is giving them examples and naturally varied reviews. So I'm trying to help them understand something. Uh, very rarely, like really never will I uh, try to use Japanese to teach them English or, or the other way around. Is it good to use closed captions for improving English skills? Yes, that's perfectly fine. Uh, what you don't want to do is get translations in your native language. You should be just reading the actual uh, captions or the transcript of something. Uh, so this is why in Fluent for Life we have full transcripts. You can click on specific words in the uh, interactive transcript and it will jump right to that section of the video. So it's very convenient for people to learn. Uh, Juliana says, what about the uh, intonation? I know some people who are very fluent, but the way they speak was absolutely monotonous. It gives you a turn off <laughs> or it turns you off. Yes. <clears throat> Again, the uh, often you can you can tell how people are uh, or the way their speech is by how they learn. And you can kind of guess, oh, I can I can look at speakers and OK, this person learned in this country or they learned in this way. I can tell just by the way they speak. The learning is is obvious. So I always say how you learn is how you speak. How you learn is how you speak. How you learn is how you speak. That's like a, a mantra. You know, I just say that again and again. How you learn is how you speak. And it's really important for people, uh, again, if you only hear one speaker, so you have one teacher or one speaker or something like that that's giving you all your information. Like if I live in a house with my mom in the middle of a forest and she is the only one talking to me, I am going to sound a lot like my mom because I have no other examples of how I should sound. You know, it makes sense. And so that's why like people sound like their parents. But as you get older and you start getting more examples of things from different people, you know, if you like a, a student will maybe listen to an English, like a textbook listening practice exercise or something, uh, and they will sound like that. They will try to repeat after that person, but natives don't speak that way. So you need to get the naturally varied review. You need that input from lots of people. So it's much better, instead of you trying to repeat a phrase or something, I like to go to the park, or I go to school, I go to school, I go to school. So I'm going to repeat that phrase to myself. It's much, much better for me to hear 10 natives, 10 different people say, I go to school. So one person's like, I go to school. And another person's like, I go to school. And another person's like, I go to school. And the mom is like, I go to school. You know, you're going to hear all these different examples. Some of them will be clear. Some of them will not be clear. But you will develop that network that allows you to understand how that works. All right. Isn't that cool, though? Remember, this is how you learned your native language. If you really think back, you're like, wait a minute. Like, my mom said, wash my hands. And my dad said, wash my hands. And, you know, that kind of thing. Like, all, all of these different examples of things, this is how you learned your native language. There's no difference 
between trying to learn English and learning your native language. But people think it's a different language, so you have to learn it in a different way. But it's actually not true. All you do is just learn it the same way you learned your native language, and you will learn to speak in the same way that you speak your native language. Now, obviously, you maybe you've been speaking your native language for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 80 years or whatever, and you will have spent less time with English, but it's much better for you to spend your time not doing this, doing this. Spend time with the language. You don't need to speak. You just need to get the input from lots of different people. You need the naturally varied review. All right, let me go back and see if I had any more questions over here. Um... Which book do you learn or recommend to learn vocabulary? Well, it depends. There isn't like a vocabulary book for learning. What I do in Fluent for Life is I, I let you choose the particular topics you're interested in. So let's say you want to learn about taking care of pets or whatever. Then you listen to the vocabulary about that thing. You hear it from different speakers. You hear different people talking about it, different speeds, different grammar, all of that. You're learning all of that uh, about that particular topic. So a book for, for one person might not be good for a different person, right? So you don't look for like a vocabulary book. You look for like, what are the things you're interested in? If you like fixing cars, then watch YouTube videos about fixing cars. You will learn a lot of vocabulary and you will hear different natives talking about the same thing. You could even watch like, I don't know, like take a, a video game or a movie or whatever, something you like. You will find lots of people. So the uh, like the video game uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild, if you know that game. So there are tons and tons of videos about people saying basically the same thing. <laughs> but in different ways about it, you know? So people struggle, like, how can I say something different? I wanna say something new, so people will watch my video about it. But as a learner, this is a great resource for people. All I've done is in Fluent for Life made it systematic. So it's not just getting it. Often people have trouble finding the kind of, like the right information to learn. Uh, what should we be focusing on? How can we learn it? How can we understand it? To make all of that simple, I did all the hard work for you in making the lesson sets for Fluent for Life. But you could, by yourself, do that same kind of thing. Uh, how to pronounce schedule. That's another thing. Get Frederick. It will teach you how to pronounce words like that and spell them. Schedule. You will hear some people, again, it's not about one kind of pronunciation. Like in British English, they might say like schedule. Schedule. All right. Uh, I answer a couple more, and then I got like a little bit of time. I'm probably going to lo lose my battery out here. Samuel asks, uh, why do you decide to live Japan? I'm strongly eager uh, to hear about it. Uh, so my story, I came to Japan in 2003 to study Japanese gardening. So I love bonsai and wanting to learn how to build that. That's why I came to Japan. But I couldn't get a visa to do that, so I got a teaching visa, and I could come here and teach. And I actually enjoy teaching a lot. You know, I proved to be a good teacher. I proved to be a good teacher. Uh, and so it proved to be a fun thing for me to do. So I actually don't do anything at all with gardening right now, except just uh, enjoying gardens uh, around where I live and that kind of thing. Uh, but that's why I came to Japan. So again, I came uh, and I couldn't speak. So even living in Japan for a year and trying to do traditional studying, I still couldn't uh, I couldn't speak. I couldn't speak at all. So even though I was living in Japan, I was still learning the traditional way. And again, I'm trying to do this, like, got to learn more words, got to learn more words, got to learn more words. It's like, no, 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 you don't got to learn more words. You got to understand like a native. It's much better. Think about children. Children often speak better than adults, even though children know fewer words. All right. Do I understand the Australian accent? Yes. And the reason I understand the Australian accent is because I've spent time listening to Australian speakers. All right. Uh, is it good? Okay, I think we answered that one already. Stages for beginners to learn languages. You, it's, the same, it's the same way you learn whether you're a beginner or advanced, if you're learning the native way. You still learn new vocabulary in your native language the same way you learned it when you were a child. You get understandable messages, and then you're getting naturally varied review. Lots of examples that help you understand things. Uh, Anderson's asking about Anki cards is the same that reading book to memorize and learn at the same time the content. Uh, again, it, the, the format of the information, like you might have a, fla a flash card by itself is not bad. It's just how people use flash cards. So trying to take uh, one flash card with one word and repeating that again and again, it's going to be much more difficult for you to remember because your brain doesn't want to do that. So the flash card is not the bad thing. It's just, it's much better instead of trying to give yourself a whole bunch of things to learn. So you don't, you don't want to hear like just the same word 
in exactly the same way over and over again. But you do want to hear the word used in different contexts and actual situations uh, from different speakers. And again, this is what we give in naturally very important, uh, naturally uh, varied review that you get in Fluent for Life. Uh, okay. So Anki Car, okay, I answered that one. Woo, I, uh, you need not a great idea at entrance, uh huh. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, is accent really important? Uh, accent is less important than uh, grammar. So grammar is going to be the most important thing you should be focusing on. Um, but your accent, again, will develop naturally your speaking voice. So you have a particular English speaking voice that will sound natural and lovely to people, but you have to get lots of examples from other people to find your voice. So the, the tricky thing is one teacher in a classroom, like if you are just trying to repeat after me, yeah, you will sound a little bit like I do, but maybe your voice is not, is not like, you know, exactly right for the way I speak. You know, I have a, like you can hear me, I have kind of a nasally sounding voice. So I can copy other people. I could try to talk like Morgan Freeman or, you know, some like other famous actors, something like that. Um, but this is my natural speaking voice. All right. So it's not it's not about getting one example and trying to copy that. You want to get lots of examples and then you find the right thing for you. You will naturally develop something that's like, oh, this is this is like designed for my speaking voice. So you can hear the differences even in American English speakers. Like I can I can close my eyes and listen to someone be like, ah, that's probably an Asian lady speaking English, even if she's a native speaker born like a, like a. Uh, an Asian woman born in the United States speaks only English. I can tell she's Asian by the way she sounds. Isn't that interesting? And it's just, again, the natural speaking voice, like the physical structure of your, uh, your face. Each person has their own unique way of speaking. So don't worry about trying to sound exactly like somebody else. But if you want to speak smoothly and naturally, you get that by getting lots of different examples, not by trying to just copy one person. You can, you can if, if there's one person, like you like an actor or something, uh, and you want to sound like that person and they have a good fit for your voice, you can certainly do that. Uh, but that's, again, going to be something that you get from the review. All right, I'll take a few more. Well, I already getting the low battery message over here. Uh, let's see. So, uh, all right, elderly, elderly. You're asking the pronunciation of that, okay, elderly. Uh, I've never got thinking in English. I understand more gringos than Latin people when speaking in English, and I'm a Latin man. <laughs> yep, so thinking in English is what you get when you understand like a native. That's all it is. You don't need to be a native to understand like a native, okay? All right, Zach, yeah, I installed Frederick a few weeks ago. Uh, you're a voice actor in the app, don't you? Why did you decide to start to create the app? Uh, yes, I began Frederick, so it's all my voice. So if you actually enjoy my voice and you want to improve your pronunciation with my voice, uh, that's what Frederick is. Uh, but in the future, I want to add like an American, you know, female voice or uh, like British pronunciation as well, Australian English, so that way you can hear the difference between all these different sounds. Um, so that will be in the future, but that's one of the things I'd like to do. It'd probably make the app really big, though. <laughs> so we might uh, turn it into a web app instead. The reason I did it is because I wanted to show people uh, that it's possible to learn English all in English. So I wanted to make, like, the name of my company is English Anyone. And the reason it's English Anyone is because it's for anyone to learn the language. And so I wanted to make one system that anybody around the world can use. So you can take Frederick and I can give it to somebody in China or Russia or Brazil or wherever, and anybody can use it to learn uh, English and improve their vocabulary, their pronunciation. Uh, and yeah, so it's one, it's one system that you can actually, without using your native language, uh, actually teach yourself the language. So it's the world's first language discovery system, I call it. Uh, and actually, I was just showing Frederick uh, over the weekend. So I went to the Japan, what do they call it? Japan uh, Language, Japan Association of Language Teachers, the JALT Conference. Uh, and so I was showing that to Frederick and everyone was like, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. Because most people are just using one language to teach another one, all right? Almost any vocabulary app, it's gonna give you translations, like here's one thing and here's another. But it's the nuances that help you become a fluent speaker. All right, uh, Samir, is it, is it good to improve English by communication skills by speaking in front of the mirror? No, don't do that. Don't waste your time doing that. If you've got five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, just get more input. 
Don't try to repeat things in front of a mirror or whatever. You don't need to do that. Your mind will automatically build your fluency just by getting the input, all right? Hopefully this is an exciting idea. It was an exciting idea for me <laughs> when I discovered this. And I said, oh wow, look at that. I can become a fluent speaker without feeling nervous about speaking. Because the goal is not for me to speak to get fluent, it's to understand to get fluent. I know this is, it's, this is the opposite from what everybody tells you and uh, the only thing I can say like, for you to believe me is just try it. Uh, and so this is why I make a lot of videos on YouTube which are just giving examples of this. So helping you understand like a native, you notice I'm not using a different language to teach you English, it's all in English and giving you lots of different examples. But even just me, it's not really enough. Uh, I want to have uh, people uh, able to to understand things uh, with like not just my voice, but uh, other voices as well. And so, if you can learn that way, you will become a fluent speaker very quickly without uh, trying to have a, a like a person speaking with you all the time. So it doesn't matter where you live, or how old you are, or if you have a native speaking friend or not. All you need is the input, and that's what I give. Uh, influent for life. So Fluent for Life actually lets you go through and teach yourself the language uh, and get the input that you need to become a fluent speaker without needing to go anywhere. You can do it anytime you like and that's why it's the fastest way to learn because you don't have to wait for anybody else. Whenever you want to learn that's going to give you naturally very varied review. So you're not going to be bored. You're going to learn like a native, understand like a native. So you think like a native, and then you speak like a native. So speech is the result of learning this way. It's not trying to learn a word and then repeat it to yourself in the mirror. Like science has already proven this doesn't work. All right, so the point is to get more review. If you've got 10 minutes a day, just get the review, all right? Just get their review. The more review you get, the more confident you will feel. As often people don't speak because they, they feel like, ah, okay, I don't know the vocabulary well enough, or my pronunciation isn't very good, my grammar isn't very good. And it's because they don't get enough review. That's why they, uh, that's why they don't become uh, good speakers. My tutor always advised me to speak loudly, but I can't, only when I speak English and also get nervous. Can you tell me how to overcome that? The reason people get nervous is because they don't feel confident about the vocabulary or the grammar or the pronunciation. So teachers will say, all right, like this is what a typical English lesson is like this. You have a, like a lesson you're listening to. So like maybe the teacher will say something. Okay, here's a word and now I want you to like repeat after me. Repeat after me. Now you can do that, but again, uh, as I've just explained, it's much better to do this than to do this. So repeat after me and I like use a loud voice and say something, but like, but I, I don't feel confident about what I'm saying. <laughs> if you don't feel confident about what you're saying, then don't speak. You don't have to speak. That's not what's speaking is not what's gonna get you fluent. It's understanding. <clears throat> so I say, like, here's a word like bath. Repeat the word bath, and you hear it and you're just kind of like. Maybe my pronunciation, like the, like the Japanese uh, pronunciation, like, like the TH sound is not in Japanese. And so Japanese people say like ba basu, basu. It sounds like, like bus a little bit, basu. So this sound is not in Japanese. So a Japanese person, it's like, okay, I'm going to stand up in front of the class and try to pronounce basu, basu, basu. Like their, their mind is not actually processing that information because one teacher uh, says something. Wow, hello from North Korea. Awesome. Hopefully everything is going okay. Please stop shooting missiles at Japan. <laughs> Please stop shooting missiles at Japan. That's like in the news lately. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, it's King Jong-il. Uh, King Jong-un. Oh my goodness. All right. So remember, if you get one example from something, of course it's going to be difficult. But if instead you listen to 20 different people say the word bath, you'll be like, ah, I get it. I get it. You're hearing all these different examples from people and you're hearing it in different ways. It's the naturally varied review, all right? So instead of spending your time trying to speak or speak louder or speak to yourself in the bathroom or whatever, like it's not building your fluency. It's also not building your network, just repeating something again and again. It's the input that gets you fluent and it's the naturally varied review that keeps you interested in what you're learning so you can get the review. If you just repeat something again and again, it gets very boring, 
All right. So this is why I built Fluent for Life. I wanted a system. This is the same way I got fluent in Japanese. So after struggling for 15 years, failing to learn Latin, Spanish, French, and Japanese, I finally became fluent in Japanese when I just started doing this. All right. Now it was trouble for me because I had to teach myself how to do it. So I would go to a cafe and just listen. I would listen to lots of different people ordering food at a cafe. Okay, it's very simple. So I sit down and listen. I can hear like a hundred people order some food at a cafe. I, I pretend like I'm reading a book, but I'm just listening to other people. And it's like, oh yeah, they use that expression. And then, oh, that person said it like a little bit differently. How to pronounce dog, dog. It's like an ah, ah sound, dog, dog. But some people in different parts of the United States pronounce it a little bit differently. Uh, in Frederick, we put that, so there's like, there's the word con, like the short vowel O sound, ah, ah, con, and then dog, the different sound, ah, 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 ah. But in Frederick, it actually shows you how to learn that. So it teaches you these things in different, so you would hear like dog and cog and other words like that that have the ah sound. How to pronounce the, the. That's also in Frederick. Anyone asking me questions about how to say something, just get Frederick. It will tell you how to pronounce over 2,000 words and sentences. All right, I'm gonna shut it down because uh, again, my battery is uh, gonna run out on a, like very, uh, very, very soon. All right, so should I focus only on uh, listening without speaking in front of the mirror? Yes. So again, uh, it's not just about listening, it's about understanding. And you might get that from touching something, tasting something, smelling something, listening to it, watching it, however you need to understand something. And that's why we do things in different ways in, uh, in Fluent for Life. All right, so from Burkina Faso, this will be a last question. Uh, I would like to thank you for all you do for helping learners uh, improve their, uh, improve the English level. Okay. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I, as, again, I struggled to learn languages. I know what it's like, but once I discovered this, I said, I have to tell everybody. This is amazing and more people should know about this. And if they do it, then they can become fluent speakers. Frederick is an app I created. Uh, it's the world's first language discovery system for learning English. So that way you can actually develop your pronunciation all in English. And the interesting thing is for developing pronunciation is you're not trying to just hear uh, like one person say something. You want to hear the differences between sounds. And when you can do that, when you can compare the different sounds, like we've got bit or bat or butt, when you can compare these and you can do that without waiting for a teacher, so teacher, how do you say this? How do you say that? It's like you can just, the app will tell you exactly how to say it and you can compare these different sounds. Bit, bat, but. So if you'd like to have better pronunciation and understand natives more clearly, get Frederick. So go to EnglishAnyone.com and you can learn more about all of these things. I'm now about like 5% left in my battery, so I'm going to say goodbye for now. But thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Patrick, nice to see you in South Africa. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments later or send us a mail at info at englishanyone.com. But if you'd like to learn more about all the programs, you can click on the link uh, in this video. It will teach you more about Fluent for Life, and you can learn more about Frederick as well on the channel. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.